Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone and welcome to this uh, webinar organized by Borenzi Europe and today's topic is carbon dioxide removal certification. A very, I would say, hot topic because very recently at the end of November last year, the European Commission published a proposal uh, for certifying carbon removals and this is going to be the basis of uh, today's uh, discussion. Uh, uh, for just a quick update, um, we had uh, a change in the program of this event because one speaker had to cancel his participation at the last minute. And also my colleague Ennio Prizzi, who is usually following uh, the carbon removals dioxide um, file in Bionzi Europe, is ill today, so he won't be able to join. So you will have to bear with me for a very quick uh, introduction and then uh, I, I will pass the floor to Fabian Ramos from the European Commission, who will give the proposal, and then my colleague René Di Padua will take over and lead the panel discussion. Before we begin into the, uh, the contents of today's presentation of webinar in earnest, uh, I would like to say a few words sorry, about uh, Bioenergy Europe. Give me a second. Okay. So uh, Bioenergy Europe is the common voice of the European Bioenergy since the 1990s, which used to be known as IBIOM. And together we bring together around 40 national associations and around 150 companies representing all steps of the Bioenergy value chain. We host the European Pellet Council, the EPC, and we are involved with two quality and sustainability certification schemes. Sure, which has to do with the requirements of uh, biomass sustainability for Red2, and EN Plus, which is, has to do with the fuel quality of wood pellets. Uh, our services to our members include the EU policy monitoring and uh, advocacy, market intelligence data, visibility networking, and others. Uh, of course, our vision is that Bioenergy would be a key pillar in delivering a carbon neutral uh, Europe. And uh, carbon neutrality has two components. Uh, you have the avoidance of CO2 emissions, but you also have carbon removals uh, from the atmosphere. And as I mentioned before, this is going to be the topic of today's presentation. Uh, here is just a quick snapshot of our members. As I said before, we are around 190 in total members, national biome associations from the member states, companies, as well as some members of the research and the academic world. Uh, our working groups is a service that we provide to our members only, and they are dealing with uh, topics of primary of great interest for the bioenergy sector. So uh, we have uh, working groups, for example, on domestic heating, uh, dealing with uh, residential appliances for bioenergy, stoves and boilers primarily. Uh, for, we have a working group focusing on the pellet markets, a working group on the emerging uh, sector of uh, agrobiomass, another working group dealing with uh, wood supply, uh, a working group of competitiveness having to do with um, especially policy files that are influencing, uh, I would say, the bigger industries such as the carbon tax, state aid rules, and so on. Uh, the very relevant uh, working group on sustainability dealing with uh, the policy updates that are affecting the biomass sustainability criteria, in a sense, I'm talking about RED2 and RED3. And very, very recently, uh, we established uh, uh, an independent working group explicitly for the carbon dioxide removal topic. And this also reflects, I think, the interest uh, for this, um, uh, yeah, for this uh, theme, uh, both within Bioenergy Europe uh, and in general for uh, the year for the year for Europe. Uh, another, I would say, anecdotal evidence that demonstrates the. Uh, uh, the importance of this topic is that today we had, I think, more than 300 participants registered for this event, which clearly shows that there is a big interest for the sector. Uh, we, finally, we are also working uh, on our market intelligence, as I said before, and uh, one of the things we are doing there is the publication of our statistical reports. This is a leading source of bad statistics in Europe since 2007. This is something that is only available for our members. And uh, yeah, you can, but all, uh, even as if you are not a member, you can get a sneak peek of these by visiting our website and requesting for a sample copy of them. Uh, and finally, just uh, a photo from our team in a sunny day in uh, Brussels, where you can see all of us uh, smiling, including my absent colleague, Ennio. I hope he gets better okay. soon. Uh, for uh, the practicalities of the webinar, a uh, small request from our side, please uh, change your name tag if it's not set properly with your first name and last name so that we know who is 
uh, asking questions. If you have any kind of technical issues, you can use the chat or email my colleague uh, Francisco uh, in uh, the email you see on the screen. And if you have any questions, you can use the Q&A function. Uh, we will take some questions immediately after Fabian's presentation. And finally, uh, we'll also take questions during uh, the panel discussion. Uh, so, uh, I mentioned today that we have uh, had some changes in the program, uh, but uh, still I think we are going to have a very interesting uh, discussion and we might manage to finish a little earlier, which would be a rare occurrence for webinars and events in general. Uh, so, without further ado, I would like to introduce Fabian Ramos. Fabian is a policy officer at the European Commission involved in DG Clima. Uh, he has been very active in the Sustainable Carbon Cycles uh, Initiative, which I understand was the precursor of the proposal that we now have on our hand. And of course, he is also instrumental in the formulation of the current proposal. So, Fabian, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, I think you can try and share your screen. Uh, and yeah. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, Manolis. Now um, I'm sharing my screen. I hope it's uh, working. Uh, just let me know if you see the slides correctly. Uh, I hope so. Because uh, it seems you that have I to cannot... go into presentation mode, but otherwise yeah. you see them. Yeah, but I, I I try to click on presentation mode, but it doesn't work. So I'm curious to know why it doesn't work. Um. Oh, interesting. Oh, oh, I know. Yeah, mm, yeah. So the presentation mode is the only button that is not working. Uh, otherwise, Fabian, we can show the yeah. presentation if you prefer. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's do like that. I'm going to, to close this. And uh, yeah, I propose you share the uh, slides. From. I can do it in, uh, oh, okay. Good. So thank you very much. And um, yes. Uh, thank you for also giving me the opportunity today to um, give you a, a presentation of uh, of this proposal on carbon removals that um, was um, adopted end of last year, as you said, uh, uh, on in the end of November last year. So this proposal is under, uh, proposing a certification uh, framework for carbon removal and uh, regulation on this. So today I'm going to give you a little bit of context and uh, to try to explain you what are the main aspects, the key aspects um, of this uh, proposal. And next slide, please. So I would like to start with um, why is this proposal, from, from where it's coming. Five years ago, we, we were working on the long-term strategy for the European Union. It was in the context of the, of the UNFCCC discussion and the Paris Agreement and the uh, parties of this Paris Agreement were encouraged to, to come with a, um, a long-term strategy towards 2050. And, uh, and you know that at that time, we proposed for the first time in Europe, this ambition of being uh, climate neutral by 2050. So Europe was uh, one of the first region uh, to propose this, um, again, very ambitious target. And in the preparation on, of this long-term strategy, very quickly, we realized that to be climate neutral by 2050, just reducing emissions will not work. We could not cut all the emissions down to zero. And we, we knew that we will have some residual emissions in some key sectors, such as uh, agriculture sectors, such as um, some industries maybe, and also transportation in particular with aviation. And to be climate neutral, because by climate neutral, we wanted to, we mean net zero greenhouse gases emissions. We had to neutralize these residual emissions um, with uh, carbon removals and different type of carbon removals, nature-based solutions, and um, also industrial solutions to remove carbon. Next slide, please. So, uh, uh, the, 
the um, context of that. So we, by in the end of 20, uh, when was it? In the end of 2019, I think, this um, ambition was agreed and we got a, a political agreement between the European Parliament, member state, and in early 2020, we set this ambition in the climate law. So the climate law um, has a clear objective that is now mandatory and is set into law that by 2050, the European Union should be climate neutral and should aim at uh, going towards net removal after 2050. And this is a very important point. It's not that we need carbon removal only to be climate neutral in 2050, but after 2050, we'll need to continue to be, to be net removal. So to have more, uh, to remove more carbon from the atmosphere than uh, to, to emit uh, carbon to the atmosphere. And it's of course also very important in the context of the international discussion and the IPCC, where we know that uh, it's very unlikely that we will manage to achieve the objectives of the Paris Agreement without carbon removal. Uh, it's, it's likely that uh, we might um, go beyond uh, the temperature objective that we set and to go back at the end of the century to uh, the objective, uh, the temperature objective and to limit the global warming, we might need, uh, it's very likely that we will need uh, carbon removal. And this is what the latest analysis done in the um, scientific reports of uh, the IPCC is, uh, is, um, is showing. Um, another element of context is what we are doing uh, on the internal uh, European climate policies, and in particular on the one on land use, land use change and forestry, the LULUCF regulation. In this one, for the very first time, uh, the U European Commission has proposed um, a specific target for carbon removal from the LULUCF sector, hmm? a specific target of minus 310 million tons of CO2 at the European level by 2030, and then also uh, member state um, objectives uh, uh, within this uh, regulation. Um, this has been agreed uh, by the European Parliament and the member state, and end of last year, we, come, and, uh, we threw a, a political agreement on that, and now this is also set into law by 2030, the LULUCF emissions that were in a declining trend this last year, and I think uh, the current sink is below 250 million tons of CO2. Well, now in the law, we have something that is telling us that by 2030, we need to reverse this trend and to increase again the sink function, the absorbing the, of, the, of, the, of the forest and land in Europe. So also absorbing more CO2 from the atmosphere through forest and land. And um, a last element on that context is uh, the communication. Um, we had the end of last year on sustainable carbon cycle, where we present our vision uh, in terms of uh, carbon management for the future, for the mid-term and long-term future in Europe. And in this uh, communication, we address many um, aspects. We address uh, the fact that we need uh, to stop to use fossil sources of carbon um, towards 2050 and to replace that with new sources of carbon uh, for our economy. So when you need carbon to produce plastic, to produce chemicals, to produce fuels, should not be anymore a carbon coming from a fossil source, but it should be a carbon coming for either recycling uh, a carbon from uh, uh, waste recycling and other type of recycling or um, uh, biogenic sources of carbon. So this is, was an, an important element of the communication and the communication was also um, looking very carefully at uh, the role of land and forest in the future and how we could uh, put in place practices at the level of the forester, at the level of farmer to enhance this uh, natural thing that we have in Europe and to reach by 2030 this 310 million tons of CO2 of natural things and uh, even further in the future to continue to have a healthy um, Lulu CF thing. Uh, and for that, uh, we, uh, we, sh we have shown that a carbon farming uh, uh, is a solution for that. So to, to propose a new framework for farmers, for foresters in Europe, for land managers in Europe, to have a, a better recognition of the carbon removal services uh, that is provided by the, by the land and by their activities. And finally, the last pillar of this uh, communication was on carbon removals. So by 2030, we had a, 
kind of aspirational challenge in this uh, communication. And we wanted to have by 2030, 5 million tons of CO2 uh, removed from the atmosphere by industrial uh, means, so by industrial solutions. It can be different type of industrial solution. It can be um, uh, BEX, so bioenergy and CCS. And we often mention this. And when you look at the modeling of the IPCC, there is a, a lot of reliance in the future on, on this technology. Uh, it can be direct air capture and CCS. And I will even say today that uh, it does not stop there. And we should be open to all the kind of industrial solution. And uh, why not, for instance, an underwork weathering in the future? And um, in, a, in a shorter term, uh, we also need to look at, uh, can we consider, for instance, biochar as a, a permanent solution to remove carbon? Uh, can we have uh, um, biochar used in a such condition that uh, we are 100% sure that the carbon captured and stored in the biochar is not released to the atmosphere. So this is a, a good question that um, I'm, I'm going to talk about it uh, later on. The expert group that will work and will support with us on the development of the methodology for the certification framework, um, we'll have to look at. But I will go come back to that later on. Next slide, please. So the scope of the initiative, what is it? Um, I already uh, in, into it. And it's about uh, carbon farming. It's about carbon storage in products and it's about uh, permanent storage. Um, it's a very large scope, very different type of activities. And we have to recognize the benefit of this different type of carbon removal. When it's about carbon farming, very often, uh, when you improve the quality of your soil to remove more carbon, it has a co-benefit on biodiversity, for instance. Uh, when it's about carbon storage in products, when you replace um, uh, concrete, uh, so, um, a current uh, 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 current process to to produce concrete in Europe and to, to for the buildings with a new type of concrete with uh, advanced or novel um, method uh, method to produce concrete or with other substitutes such as uh, uh, biochar. I was mentioning biochar, and I know that uh, some biochar application could come uh, as a substitute of uh, of uh, concrete in in some buildings. So when you substitute some energy intensive and fossil intensive material with uh, some products that remove carbon from the atmosphere and store it for a, a, a quite long period, uh, even if it's not permanent, I think uh, it's also something very beneficial. And the last one is on permanent uh, storage, of course. So uh, the, the, the big advantage of this type of technologies, I mentioned them, bags, DACs, and others, is that you are sure that once the carbon is stored, it's stored almost forever. We, we have this permanence aspect that for centuries, millennia, there will not be leakages of carbon. And we have to put in place the methodologies that will actually assure that, um, um, yeah, everything is done correctly at the level of the carbon removal activities to guarantee that the carbon is not leaked. And, and, and it ha this has to be recognized, this permanent aspect. So different type of carbon removal solutions, and we need all of them for our climate neutrality, but they are with different characteristics and all characteristics need to be recognized. Next slide, please. What is the objective of this? Uh, I briefly uh, mentioned in, in, in the introduction our intention to, to use this as a tool to support our action towards uh, climate neutrality by uh, 2050 and also all the, the pathway toward uh, this climate neutrality. So what does it mean? It means that this certification uh, scheme for carbon removal is not an initiative on the use of the certificate. It's more on the supply. It's to provide guarantees that if the carbon removal activities is following the requirement of the certification, uh, we are sure that it's a good quality carbon removal. And what does it mean good quality? I will come back to that. We have different criteria. Um, four main criteria uh, uh, along uh, the quantification of the removal, the additionality of the removal, the permanence or the long-term storage of the removal rather than permanence, and the sustainability of the removal. I will go um, to that in detail. So we have this, and we think that it's essential to ensure trust in this type of activities in Europe and to have um, um, that the carbon removal can be used uh, I would say safely, if I can, uh, on a, in a, 
and to be integrated in our climate policies in Europe for the, in particular for the post 2030. But it goes also beyond that. It's not only about integration in our future policy. We also think that at, uh, in the short term, this can be a useful framework, um, for instance, uh, to, to look at the state aid and to ensure that if there is some carbon removal activities that uh, member states want to support, uh, well, this tool could help them to identify which one are good one and which one and on which one we can have more doubts. And uh, if a carbon removal activity is certified, then um, the member state know that it's a good carbon removal. And this is the same for all different types of public and private support. In uh, Europe, we have the Innovation Fund uh, from the ETS allowances, from money coming from the ETS allowances. We can imagine that in the future, um, projects with carbon removal could get uh, also a benefit from this certification. At corporate level, uh, the European Commission is working on different initiatives and one initiative of, on uh, green claims. So uh, what does it mean to be uh, gen, uh, climate neutral or carbon neutral or net zero and this kind of claims? And um, also our colleague at FISMA are working on uh, corporate sustainability reporting. So to provide standard for corporates um, on how to report all the sustainability elements uh, attached to, to their activities. And on that, we, I think the, the draft of the technical uh, advisory group on, on this initiative has been published recently on, on the standard for climate change. And, um, and we can see in the standard, there is a clear distinction between uh, emission reduction target and carbon removal activities within and, we, where, and out of the, the value chain. So again, the certification can help on that. And, and many others, I'm not going to go to, through all this list, but just to say that, um, yes, there is different potential use of this certificate. And our, our initiative is really into focusing into uh, the supply of this carbon removal more than the use, but other initiative uh, will look at how, how the use and the uh, make use of this certificate simply. And the last point I wanted to say is about voluntary carbon markets, of course, on the shorter time, I think it could be good also to, to try this certificate that will come in the coming years uh, before going immediately to the mandatory uh, framework, so to the compliance framework, to try them more for voluntary carbon, uh, sorry, voluntary climate action and voluntary carbon markets could be uh, one of, of these places where it, it can be very relevant. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, this I already mentioned it, so maybe I'm going to skip it to, to the next one. Uh, the next one is um, <clears throat> about um, the, 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 the different quality criteria that we propose in this general framework. Well, yes, you have seen it probably if you read uh, the proposal. This is a very general framework. We are presenting um, key concepts, key, uh, key principles that we think are very important in order to, to qualify uh, the, the carbon removal. But we are not presenting very specific methodology on one specific carbon removal type of carbon removal activities. We are more presenting yeah, the key concepts and the key principle that has to be um, followed by, um, by the developer of this kind of activities. The first one is on, on, on quantification. This is about monitoring, reporting, and verification to be sure that the measurement of the carbon removal is done in an accurate way with all the principles that have to be respected. Um, that um, is verified by independent authority, but this I will come back later on that. Um, that uh, if there is any um, side emissions due to the carbon removal activity, so leakages uh, somewhere else, not directly in the, in the value chain, but out of the value chain, it has to be accounted for. Um, we will have to, uh, through this uh, uh, criteria to look at, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, a kind of life cycle assessment approach for carbon removal coming from industrial solutions or for permanent storage, <coughs> sorry, or for um, um, storage in product. So all this element of quantification to be sure that at the end, the number that is on the certificate, the number uh, representing the quantity of carbon removal is a good one and is not, there is no uh, overestimation of this number. Then we have the criteria on additionality, and this is in particularly important in the context of voluntary carbon market, as you know, to be sure that uh, um, when we support money 
and we, when we finance carbon removal, we support with money. When we finance carbon removal, we do it and in a way that is triggering action, that we do not do double pay uh, some, um, some, some carbon removal that uh, will anyway happen even without the incentive of this certification. There is also the question of long-term storage and it's linked to the quantification uh, aspect is for how long the carbon is going to be stored uh, for 10 years, 15 years uh, in a carbon farming context or for 50 years, maybe 100 years for, for some product or in, in a permanent way for several centuries. And we want to be very transparent on that. We don't want to mix the different things. Yes, our certification scheme is, the scope of this scheme is many different types of carbon removals with different characteristics in terms of duration of the removal. But we want on each certificate a clear identification of the duration of this removal. And if the removal can be guaranteed only for 10 years, uh, then it has to be very clear if the removal brings enough uh, guarantees again that is going to be permanent that is monitored correctly over time that there is some liabilities in place uh, in case of leakage etc and and then we can consider it permanent that <clears throat> is also clearly indicated oh, sorry <clears throat> and the last aspect is um, is about um, sustainability to be sure that we okay we want we need this carbon removal to reach our climate objectives and we want these removals also that they do not uh, harm other environmental aspects. So uh, with this sustainability criteria, we check that carbon removal activities do not have a negative impact on biodiversity, on water pollution, on air pollution, or on other uh, aspects. Again, in this general framework that we are proposing today, we don't go into the details of uh, specific carbon removal activities. This is a work that is going to take place uh, this year, next year, uh, with the development of specific methodology for specific type of carbon uh, removals. We are going to do that together with um, an expert group, so with the support of an expert group. And at a certain point, um, difficult today to say tell you exactly when, but we will come with delegated acts that will be much more detailed and specific on uh, the different rules for different type of uh, carbon removal activities. How everything should be monitored, reported, verified, uh, how to assess a criteria on additionality, what are the requirements in terms of sustainability, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, this one is about uh, um, the process of the certification. Um, we have also established some criteria on that. Um, and one of them is, of course, uh, something that is very common in this uh, type of certification is to come with a third party verification. So we want really a, a, an independent auditing of the carbon removal activities. Um, and we will involve existing uh, bodies for that, certification bodies that will do uh, this assessment. Um, they will um, they will report on the carbon removal activities and prove and say yes this is true everything is following um, the um, what is written the requirement of the uh, set methodologies proposed by European Commission and um, and then it can have access to the certification so we are not going to um, to create a new agency or a new institution um, in the EU that will do the certification itself. We are more, we, we, we want to, to, to rely and uh, to, to build on existing schemes or new schemes that will be developed in the private sector for doing this work of uh, certification, of issuing the certificate, or st of storing all the information in, uh, in public registry. And we will have also uh, some, some criteria on that, on um, some requirements uh, for the, the, the registration of uh, carbon removal in, in database. To be very transparent on all the activities that are taking place to avoid double counting, double use of the certificates, et cetera, et cetera. And on that also the commission uh, might come with implementing act to better specify the rules on this aspect. Next slide, please. 
Uh, and I think this is my last slide, and this is about the next steps. So as I already mentioned, we, we need this year, and we have already started, I was thinking about that, to work on, well, we need to do two things. First, of course, we need to discuss this proposal with the European Parliament and with the member state. Well, the European Parliament and the member state have to give their views on this proposal, to possibly present some amendments. And uh, we have all this uh, uh, co-decision process that is going to take uh, place this year, maybe um, also uh, towards 2024. We really hope that we can arri arrive in a reasonable, a reasonable time um, uh, to um, a political agreement at the European Parliament and uh, at the level of the member state, and then uh, an agreement at the level of the trilogue, and to have in place this uh, certification scheme um, not too far in the future, I would say. Um, and in the same time, once we get this agreement, we need to come as soon as possible with the first methodologies that uh, will um, give us the mean to certify different type of carbon removal activities. And um, this work, we, uh, stream, we, we, also, we have also started this work um, already in January 2023. Uh, uh, and we will develop that this year in 2024 and then in 2025, 26, etc. This is an open framework and we will work progressively on the different type of uh, methodologies for removing carbon from the atmosphere. When new methodologies or new uh, solutions to remove carbon will prove that they are ready to be incorporated in the certification scheme, and then we can work together with the expert group um, on, on this uh, on the inclusion of this uh, new type of carbon removal activities to this uh, framework. So it's a very open uh, framework in this sense. One of the, the priority for us is, um, well, we have several priorities, but I can say that uh, uh, priorities involve um, carbon removal solutions involving uh, the capture of carbon from biogenic sources and permanent storage of this carbon are part of the things that uh, we are very eager to, to look at in, um, in the short term, and the experiment will have discussion in the expert group on this kind of uh, carbon removal activities in um, yeah uh, to, uh, in 2023. Um, so yes, the expert group I already mentioned it several times. Uh, we have um, we are about to to launch um, this expert group now very soon. Uh, we did the selection um, of the expert on that. Um, there was a lot of interest. We are very happy about it. And we hope that uh, uh, our plan, it's not that we hope, it's our plan is to have the first meeting of this expert group on the 7th of March uh, this year. And um, it will be a full day meeting where we are going to start the activities of, the, of this expert group. And the last point of, uh, that on which we have to work this year is also not only the certification methodology, but also all the certification process that I mentioned on how to recognize, on better defining the rules to recognize the certification scheme that could uh, join us in this initiative and uh, issue the certificates once the certification methodologies are ready. Um, I propose to stop here and, and to take uh, any question. Um, I think on the last slide, I have only links, so no need to, to show it. And uh, yes, very happy to, to try to answer to uh, to your comments or questions. Many thanks, Fabian, for setting uh, the scene uh, for the, the panel discussion later and for presenting the, the commission proposal. Uh, we have several questions uh, on the chat and from the team. Uh, and the first one I would like to ask you is uh, how you see the next steps on the political level? What should we expect? I think uh, on the political level, I think um, everybody basically, uh, agree on the importance of this initiative. Mm? Uh, I would say uh, this is something that um, was um, people really wanted to have this certification scheme to ensure uh, the good quality of the carbon removal. And I think people are happy to get it before we go for, uh, yeah, as, as a tool to ensure that the support of carbon removal activity is done in a correct uh, way and uh, that only uh, carbon removal of good quality um, can be supported. So this is something that clearly um, 
was um, was expected uh, from stakeholders and and also from different member states and also at the level of the parliament. So a lot of interest. What I want to say is that there is a lot of interest on this. Um, the discussion with the member states have not started yet, so difficult for me to comment on it. Also at the European Parliament, I think that there are first discussions that took place, but not a very formal discussion up to now. We have um, the rapporteurs that has been appointed um, uh, at, uh, at, at the European Parliament. Um, but again, I think everybody agrees that this is an important initiative, that there is a real interest to, um, to be constructive in this discussion and to, to try to put in place the, the best framework to, to, to better support carbon removal in the, in the future. Of course, there is different views as usual, different type of stakeholders with different views. And uh, we need to, to find a consensus on this program, on this proposal and on this initiative. But um, yeah, we are quite uh, optimistic and, and, uh, and, and very happy uh, with uh, the first reaction on this proposal, even if, of course, there is views that uh, differ uh, on some specific aspect from what we have proposed, but this is absolutely normal and we are very happy to engage and to, to discuss on that. Thank you, Fabian. Uh, another question I see on the chat is whether you see a potential conflict between the LULUCF targets and uh, BEC's uh, solution, because uh, carbon that is left unharvested in the forest to reach LULUCF targets would not be made available for BEC's and energy substitution solutions. Yeah. No, this is a very important point, and this is also why we need this initiative. I don't see in the context of this initiative, a conflict of interest between these two. I think this initiative is to be sure that when we support and develop something, it does not negatively impact something else. So of course, there, there is um, a compromise or a balance to be found um, between the different use and the different role of biomass in Europe uh, when you harvest it and when it's uh, stayed in the forest, in the standing forest, we have to, to ensure that what we are doing. So first, the carbon farming solution is the and, um, category of carbon removals. The, the, the carbon farming is there to help to reach this ambitious target, because this is an ambitious target of minus 310 million tons of CO2 of uh, LULUCF removal by 2030. I think we need that. Uh, we need action taking place at the level of the farmer, at the level of the forester. And we think that this uh, certification of uh, uh, carbon removal through carbon farming uh, activities could uh, could support and uh, this ambitious objective of reaching carbon removal, because then you, the farmer, the forester, will have a better recognition of what they are doing and of the service that they are providing, and and they can be supported uh, for that, and uh, and people will be will sell, sell <clears throat> um, will be um, um, more willing to invest in something that they can trust. So this is an important point. For BEX, we have this sustainability criteria and the sustainability criteria will look at, uh, at this, that uh, to be sure th that if we want a BEX activity to be certified as a carbon removal activity, the biomass needs to be renewable. It should not be a biomass that, wants in, that has a negative impact on, um, on the long-term LULUCF so the short term, there can be a discussion about the short term, but on, on what is sure is that uh, it should, have no, should not have uh, a negative impact on the long term of this year. It, should, it will have to respect the future agreement on the Renewable Energy Directive, on the revision of the Renewable Energy Directive. And, um, and yes, we, we, we need to be sure that uh, what we certify with BEX um, is in line with our overall vision to be climate neutral by 2050 and more than vision obligations due to, to the climate law. So again, I think this is a useful tool to ensure that. And, and I think with uh, this last part, you kind of answered another question. Uh, the, the, so the idea is that uh, sustainability criteria for BECs will rely on with whatever legislation is in place under Red 2 or Red 3 in the future, and they will not go beyond that, right? So uh, I think we need consistency. Um, across our policy. What is a BEX activity? It's a bioenergy plant that is storing its emission. Uh, well, it's not only that, but one of type of BEX is a bioenergy plant that is storing emission uh, underground for permanent storage. So yes, this is 
uh, renewable in the scope of the renewable energy directive or bex is um, an eth ethanol producer that is doing the same is capturing uh, the emissions and, and storing them permanently. So all that is also in the scope of the Renewable Energy Directive, so we have to be consistent. And yes, I agree uh, that uh, the criteria used for the... It will make sense that the criteria used for the Renewable Energy Directive are the same than the ones that we use in the context of the certification for carbon removal. Thank you. Uh, one other interesting question I see here is whether about the, the geographical scope of, of the scheme. Obviously, it will cover EU applications, but are you considering also the possibility of including removals generated, for example, in a non-EU country? So um, I think this is very clear in, um, in the scope, in the legal text and in the scope of this initiative. We are focusing on the European Union. Uh, what we want is to have in place something that is that fit our needs at the level of the European Union, and that will help us to and support our goal of uh, climate neutrality by 2050 once again. And this goal, when you look at the climate law, I think it's clearly said that um, it's a um, European Union goal. Um, of course, if what we are doing in, in the context of the certification scheme gives a lot of good idea to all the regions in the world to develop something similar, um, why not? But really the focus of our initiative is the European Union and potentially also the, the EEA, the European Economic Area. Uh, for instance, the CCS Directive is also covering uh, countries from the European Economic Area. Thank you. I see a lot of questions about how this scheme will be integrated or connected with the EU ETS uh, and how it will interact with it. And maybe can you elaborate a bit on that? Yes. So on this, um, so first, the scope of the scheme exclude all fossil fuel emissions from the ETS. So um, we are not going to certify as carbon removal, the capture of uh, natural gas emissions and storage underground. This has to be very clear because I know that at a certain point, there were some fears on that, but no, this is not in the scope of the ETS. Um, an ECS installation that is doing co-firing and that is burning not only fossil fuel, but also bioenergy, and you capture uh, the CO2 that is coming uh, from, from the combustion of, uh, of, the bio, of the biomass and storage can be in the scope of, uh, of this initiative. But um, we have to to be sure that there is not a double regulation or overlapping be between the two. And why a bioenergy and CCS can be in is because um, when you, you know very well that in, in the ETS, when you use sustainable bioenergy, you don't need to surrender allowances. When you do CCS, you don't need to surrender allowances. When you combine both, you don't need to do surrender allowances. And this additional benefit of doing the both in the same time can uh, do the link uh, towards the certification of, uh, of carbon removal. So we can imagine um, that this kind of, activity of activities can be at certain point in the future recognized as um, a source of carbon removal or yeah, as a carbon removal that uh, can have access to the certification. But now in more general terms, by 2050, we know that we need carbon removals to be uh, climate neutral. So we need to support the development and the deployment of all types of carbon removal solutions, including industrial type of carbon removal solutions. And the ETS is, is an important instrument for that. In the context of 55, we have been very clear, we want to focus on uh, emission reduction only. But post 2030, we will need at certain point to think about possible link between certified carbon removals and the ETS. And I think that um, when you, you read the agreed text on the ETS and the political agreement of the, on the ETS, the final text of the ETS, there is an article, I think this is Article 30, in which there is a requirement from, uh, for the Commission to look at this, to look exactly at uh, uh, the negative emissions. How can we include or do the link with negative emission within the, the ETS and to prepare even a report on that? So this is something that we will also um, look very carefully at. Um, I think the requirement is to come with such a report by uh, mid-2026, uh, if I'm not wrong. And um, I think it will be an important moment uh, to look at 
the articulation uh, between the certification scheme. Hopefully, in 2026, we'll have the form, final form of this certification scheme. We'll have the political agreement between European Parliament and Member State, uh, and uh, the ETS that has been agreed uh, end of last year. Thank you again for this. And uh, you already mentioned in your uh, presentation some potential ways uh, to, I would say, monetize, if I can say this word, carbon removals. Uh, but is there is also uh, an idea uh, that the, there could be a kind of financial incentive scheme in place for carbon removals? Sorry, I didn't get uh, your last. Yeah, sentence, I, is there any are there any thoughts or ideas about establishing also financial incentive uh, policy or schemes to reward yeah. carbon removals on the EU level? Yeah, but I think uh, uh, we were just mentioning this link, potential link between ETS and um, and carbon removals. Uh, this is a kind of uh, a financial reward. incentive that uh, often people have in mind. But uh, again, there is many others, and uh, we do not, we should not wait for this uh, link to be potentially open uh, after 2030 or whenever it will come, or it, if it's coming. Um, but we should also look at uh, other solutions. I, I was mentioning state aid condition. I was mentioning uh, innovation fund, for instance, uh, innovation fund. If one day we go for some contract for difference in the innovation fund, and uh, and uh, also on carbon removal activities. Uh, the certification scheme can be a, a, a very interesting tool uh, in this context. Um, if we if we want to talk about uh, carbon farming activities, carbon farming, um, maybe in the future, the common agriculture policy can make use of this certification scheme to validate some practices and to, to reward them in a way or in another, in a different pillar of the common agriculture policy. Um, I was mentioning the link with uh, the ETS um, uh, regulation uh, directive uh, and this Article 30. But if you look at uh, the LULUCF regulation this time, we have also some kind of hook in this regulation. I think it's, uh, if I'm not wrong, the Article 17, where um, there is mention of looking at uh, how to 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 better um, integrate. Um, carbon storage product in the LULUCF system. And maybe the certification scheme could help for that. Uh, and there is also, of course, this uh, monitoring and reporting uh, aspects for the LULUCF, where the methodologies that we're going to develop in the context of the certification scheme, uh, the, the quantification part of that, the monitoring and reporting of, of this, could be also uh, something very interesting uh, to towards um, higher quality inventories in the future for the LULUCF. So if we apply what we are going to develop for the certification scheme for specific projects, this monitoring and reporting aspect, to uh, the context of the LULUCF inventories or a more general way in Europe, it's, a, it's a also something uh, that could be very useful. So you see, I think there is many, many possibilities uh, and very interesting possibilities in the, for carbon removal in the future. Thank you, uh, Fabian. Uh, I see a more specific question about recycling fossil carbon, which apparently in some uh, articles in Red 2 is recognized as sustainable. Uh, so would that be somehow eligible for these uh, carbon removal uh, certification schemes? Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, so um, I said it, we have to be consistent between the different pieces of legislation. But consistency is, um, we have to be careful. Sometimes we are not looking exactly at the same thing. In the context of the ETS, or maybe I, I, I don't understand correctly the question, but my, my understanding is it refers, for instance, to uh, what we are doing uh, in the ETS regulation with um, CCU products uh, that are storing permanently uh, CO2, because before um, in the ETS, CO2 was considered as permanently stored only under CCS installation. And now there is a possibility to look at a permanent way to store um, CO, uh, carbon in a CCU product um, that are very stable and that uh, with no risk of leakage in, in the future. And uh, we, will, we will look also at that um, and we'll define in a better way what it means exactly in delegated um, uh, acts uh, and in particular monitoring reporting regulation of the ETS. Um, 
But if the carbon is not coming from a biogenic sources or from the atmosphere, so if it's not coming directly or indirectly from the atmosphere, but if it's coming from a, a fossil source, it cannot be considered as carbon removal. It's at best the carbon neutral, but it cannot be considered as carbon removal. And if you have in mind all the discussion on a, Re renewable fuel from non-biological origin. Um, it's the same, depending, it depends very much on, from where the carbon is coming, but also uh, the storage of carbon in, for this specific type of application uh, cannot be considered as a long-term storage. So difficult for us to qualify it as a, as a carbon renewable. Uh, thank you, Fabian. And I think uh, I will just leave you with one final question. I see that Sata, I think there are several more, but uh, some of them one way or another we have more or less. So uh, I see that uh, there is a, apparently new uh, legislation proposal about uh, prohibiting some environmental claims on consumer goods like carbon neutral or carbon positive. And I'm wondering, uh, the one who asks the question is wondering whether this will interfere with the establishment of a voluntary carbon market such as the one that is proposed by this scheme. Can you maybe comment on that? Yeah. I want to bring a clarification on this. This scheme is not at all the establishment of a voluntary carbon market in Europe. Again, we are not looking at the use of the certificates. We are looking at having a proof that the supply of carbon removal is of good quality. What we certify is the quality of the carbon removal. We are not generating a carbon credit that we are going to sell tomorrow. If some people want to use this information on carbon removal that is on the certificate, to create out of that a carbon credit, uh, we are not prohibiting it. But we are not, with this initiative, creating a new voluntary carbon market, just to, to, to be uh, uh, extremely clear on this. Um, so now, uh, regarding the claims that you, you were mentioning, I, I, said, I said it, um, corporates, this is a, a potential use of the certificate. Corporates will have to report on on their activities uh, and on the related to sustainability. So they will have to report to, to bring inventories of their activities where they report on their emission reductions, on their carbon removals, and potentially if they bought carbon credits on some voluntary carbon market to refer to report to it too. And, um, and we know, you know, there is some private initiatives such as the one of the uh, SBTI, so the science-based target initiative that defines some different type of claim, uh, climate neutrality or GAG neutrality claims, net zero claims, etc. cetera. Um, but this initiative that we are doing now is not, um, uh, is, is not addressing this type of claim and putting requirement or constraint on this type of claims. I think the one you were referring to is probably the green claim initiative that uh, um, should come now uh, this year, I think if I'm not wrong, uh, it's on the, on the Commission work program or the um, list des points prévus, uh, and uh, maybe for March or something like that, where there will be indeed uh, a bit more um, clarification about uh, what kind of claim can be done in what kind of circumstances and, 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 and bring some a bit more transparency on that, etc. But this is not an initiative that I'm personally following, so difficult for me to comment more on this. But I will say again, I don't see contradiction or a conflict with our own initiative because our own initiative is really to bring transparency of the, on the quality of the carbon removal and is not to give uh, instruction on uh, how to use it and what kind of claim to do. Thank you, Fabian. Uh, and I think we will uh, stop the Q&A with the audience uh, for you at least uh, at the, this uh, stage. Uh, it was very interesting to hear the, the proposal. I'm pretty sure that we will follow the developments uh, with the expert groups and everything through our working group on carbon dioxide removal. So Fabian, we can uh, again thank you and disengage you. Uh, and I will now, now pass the floor to my uh, colleague, Irene Di Padua, Policy Director of BNG Europe, who will moderate our panel discussion and introduce our panelists. So Irene, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Manolis, and good afternoon, everyone. Indeed, I see questions already popping in in the chat, so it really shows that there is high interest in this topic, a lot of questions and open-ended. 
but uh, I'm here today with three uh, experts in this uh, subject. And so before getting into the details of the discussion, I would like them to, to introduce them. So we'll start with Enric from Sodra. Enric, you're part of Bioenergy Europe and Sodra is one of the largest forest industry groups. So please tell us a bit more about you and Sodra. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me here. Uh, my name is Henry Prudin. I'm head of energy at Sodra. Uh, and Sodra is uh, the largest forest owner uh, corporation in, uh, in Sweden with 52,000 members, uh, small scale forest owners. And if you take a lot of small scale forest owners and group them together, it creates a quite big forest. So uh, our total forest uh, is approximately the same size as Belgium. And uh, our task uh, is to make maximize the value of the forest and to do, do the best thing uh, with the forest. So we have a production where we use uh, produce some timber and they cross laminate timber. Uh, these types of long lived products uh, where we have and combine it with short lived products such as tissue and uh, 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 pulp for uh, and uh, textile pulp and uh, also a lot of uh, bioenergy both to run our production facilities and to uh, do upgraded energy uh, such as bio oils and solid biomass uh, and I don't know if I should go into our uh, what, what we're doing in uh, this field or if we'll take it uh, later on uh, with a we, will get, we will get to that in a few minutes, but first I would like to ask maybe Johan to take the floor, since Johan is indeed responsible for BEX development at Stockholm Exergy. So Johan, please, if you could introduce yourself. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Johan Börje, and um, my first contact with European policy was, was back in 1989. I was part of the negotiations between the EFTA countries and the European community to do the EEA agreement. And since then, I've done a detour over semiconductors, telecommunications, waste management. And today I am in the team within Stockholm XGG responsible uh, to make our BEX project happen. And my focus is very much on the funding and in particular in relation to the voluntary carbon market. Uh, Stockholm XGG is the largest uh, district heating company in Sweden. Uh, we provide the heating and cooling uh, to the Stockholmers and also electricity to the grid. Our total energy delivery is around 10 uh, terawatt hours. And we supply uh, in particular heating to more than uh, 10,000 buildings. Uh, we have taken as an approach to try in an innovative way to leverage the district heating system whenever we can. So we were the first to offer a completely open system for uh, reuse of waste heat. So anyone who has waste heat in Stockholm can connect to our district heating network and we would pay for it and then repurpose it and use it for the heating uh, in the buildings. Uh, and in particular, of course, uh, we do that with the, many of the data centers in Stockholm today. Uh, we, um, uh, and of course, the BEX project is again leveraging the district heating network and, and system in, in an optimal way. And I'd also like to say that we already did carbon capture for 40 years. Between 1970 and 2011, we were doing carbon capture in order to purify and enhance the energy content of the city gas uh, that was distributed in the city. And I'll come back to our BEX project uh, later. Thank you so much, Jan, and thank you. Glad to know you've been uh, working in your affairs, but also in the energy field since uh, quite an extensive period. But now moving a bit away from Sweden <laughs> and to our third speaker for the day, uh, Sebastian, your uh, senior policy advisor at Carbon Future, which is a platform which is focusing on carbon removal. So can you please tell us a bit more about yourself and Carbon Future? Yes, yeah, certainly. And uh, thank you, Irene, for having us today. Um, very interesting topic, very timely, and great to see so many participants. So uh, Sebastian Mannert, I'm a Cambridge-trained economist. I spent 10 years as a tech entrepreneur and then advised Angela Merkel's chancellery on EU policy and also other governments around the world through the World Bank. But now, as you said, <coughs> fully focused on CDR policy through Carbon Future. And maybe a word on Carbon Future. Uh, carbon Future provides carbon removal that you can trust. And we do this in three ways. 
The first one is that we actually track carbon from the air all the way into the ground with digital monitoring, reporting, and verification tools. So this means that we know who removes carbon, who stores it, through which activity, and for how long. And I mean, when we're trying to build trust, knowing these data points is just crucial. The second thing we do is we translate this carbon removal into credits, which then unlocks revenue for suppliers. And important to note, we use a lot of third-party um, standards that exist. We don't create our own. We only rely on third-party standards for this activity. And third, um, we trade these carbon removal credits also directly with companies, with big companies such as, you know, we'll have heard of it, South Pole, Microsoft, Swiss Re, and so on. To give you a, a sense of the size, in 2022, Carbon Future um, both tracked and delivered 37,000 37, tons of high-quality CDR, um, which is around 28% of the market, uh, if you look uh, according to CDI, FYI, a great resource. But yeah, it gives you a sense. Roughly above a quarter of the market is managed by Carbon Future. Um, and for 2023, we plan to increase that to around 50 to 100,000 tons. But yeah, that's what we do. That's great. And that's also quite impressive. And I think it's clear how things are moving on fast. And uh, it's great to have your expertise and your knowledge on the sector today. But looking more at what you're actually doing on carbon removal, maybe, Enric, I can come back to you because we recently SODRA announced this initiative together with Equinor and Verdun specifically on carbon removals. Can you tell us maybe a bit more about that and in general on SODRA's activities in this field? Yes. Uh, the latest thing in this is uh, our new word, carbon, as you mentioned, together with uh, Equinor and, and uh, Verdun, where we want to be the engine to actually uh solve the problems we have today with uh, the market with the uh, uh quality a, a lot of these things uh they address here as problems to to build uh to take this investment so so we want to be uh the engine to to get these investments happening uh and uh build a market for uh, carbon credits uh and to have its uh seats as a sustainable sustainable and we build it from uh, our point of view where we have the uh, emissions and the entire way to the value chain to Equinor who is the one that will store it. So together we will uh, start try to build this market uh, and from Soda's point of view we are the largest uh, emitter of uh, point source of uh, biogenic CO2 uh, within Sweden. So we have approximately we'll say seven million tons of uh, biogenic CO2 uh, emitted each, each year, which we want to do something with. Uh, we also uh, have, as I mentioned before, long-lived products, which can go in, uh, into this, uh, our, especially uh, the CLT, uh, cross-laminated timber, uh, which we do for building large houses. Uh, and then, of course, we can go into the NBS market with uh, different types of carbon farming as well. If, uh, uh, the forest owners, uh, our farmers, want to, to get, not use the forest, but uh, store it. So we can, we are active in all fields, and we can be more active in all fields as well, since we are large in all fields. Thank you, Eric. This is really interesting, and I guess we will we'll be curious to see the next steps and how this initiative will develop. Uh, Jan, back to you. Uh, well. Stockholm Exergy has been awarded by the European Commission through the Innovation Fund to build the first large-scale VEX plant. Can you tell us a bit more about that and other initiatives that Stockholm Exergy might have in the pipeline? Absolutely, thank you. So uh, since we are already a large uh, energy provider, we have many energy plants. Uh, one of those is uh, Bio uh, CHP in the center of Stockholm. Uh, it's around 375 megawatts of capacity, and it's been up and running with a sustainable biomass flow uh, since uh, 2016. So this plant is today thus already delivering heat and electricity uh, to the Stockholm market and the national grid. Uh, based on that, we decided many years ago to initiate our work, uh, more or less R&D level, uh, for BEX and carbon capture. So we have a pilot plant up and running since 2019. Uh, that pilot plant is today uh, capturing around one ton uh, of biogenic CO2 per day. It's the same flue gases as our major plant will be when it's completed. Uh, it allows us to fine tune the recipe for the carbon capture and identify 
all the aspects necessary for us to scale this uh, to the full plant. It's a post-combustion plant. Uh, we use a technology called uh, hot potassium carbonate in order to do the carbon capture. And we uh, target uh, and of course already negotiate uh, advanced potential contracts in order to store uh, the CO2 somewhere outside the coast of Norway, I think is the appropriate way to put it at this point. Uh, we have uh, uh, the FID decision within a year, and we target commercial operation in 2026. We have already spent 50,000 engineering hours on the design, so it's a full-fledged design. And when we go live, we will be capturing in excess of 800,000 tons per year uh, biogenic CO2. Uh, from this particular plant. If we look into our full uh, portfolio of plants in Stockholm, we, we have a capability to scale that to some 2 million uh, tons, uh, then also including the biogenic CO2 in the waste to energy plants. Uh, in terms of funding, you mentioned the uh, European Innovation Fund. Of course, we're very uh, proud that we received uh, that funding and contribution, but obviously it will not be enough. And the Swedish government has announced that they will have a government aid scheme launched this year. It's a special setup uh, called reverse auction where you actually are not guaranteed the funding, but you have to compete for it. Uh, we hope to win that, obviously, uh, but we still don't believe that would be sufficient. And that's why we are heavily engaging um, with the voluntary carbon market in order to deliver the service where the acquirers of the negative emission rights uh, can bring that into their climate targets to become uh, net zero. And, and you will see a few uh, press releases in that regard coming up during 2023 is my expectation. Uh, I would like to conclude with that the big thing uh, with our implementation and, and project, of course, is the fact that we are again leveraging the district heating network all the technologies today for carbon capture do generate waste heat. And depending on what you can do with that waste heat, your product will be more or less energy efficient. And the beauty here is that we capture all the waste heat and actually repurpose that and bring it back to the district heating network and use it for heating uh, the Stockholmers. So we practically have no energy loss in the process. Thank you, Johan. That's, uh, that's an interesting point of view, and it's, uh, it's good to see indeed that uh, the expected also removals that you're looking for achieving, it's like it's something impressive, so really congrats on that as well. Uh, Sebastian, I would like to take a little bit of a different angle now, going back to you, uh, because we had Mr. Ramos presenting the proposal uh, that the Commission published at the end of November. And I wanted your opinion on the indeed the, the proposal on the table and in particular, which are for you the most relevant aspects. So looking a bit on the positive side of the, the proposal. Yeah, and first uh, I should say that in my capacity, I have a global role and so I'm quite familiar with policy around the world on CDR. And I wanna put it against that backdrop because what the EU is attempting to do here is, uh, is a first of its kind. Um, nobody's actually tried at this level to define what high quality carbon removal is. And so while you know we see different approaches, the US is throwing a lot of money at CDR and that's also having an impact for sure. The EU is taking a more cautious approach and in the long term might be really, really, really valuable for us, but also for a lot of other geographies. Because if we think about other pieces of legislation like the GDPR for data privacy, it's been replicated and often become kind of the gold standard for other geographies. So I really want to stress kind of this brave first of its kind move, which is not easy, but it's it's really, really worthwhile. The second thing I want to highlight is um, I think it's smart to rely on existing legislation. Um, so there's, for example, the CCS directive, which um, is already over, it's more than a decade old, but it provides a great foundation for DAX and BEX um, in particular, and for geological storage. I'll talk about, I think, some of the shortcomings of focusing just on that in a second, but I think it's great to create those synergies and those linkages with existing legislation that already exists. And maybe my third point is... Um, the attempt, I know that there have been some people who've been a bit upset by kind of these three categories that um, have been put out there of, you know, carbon farming, carbon products and permanent removal. Um, 
not probably the three categories I would immediately have picked, but we, it's something to work with, right? And I think it's actually really smart and amazing that we have a first attempt at creating differentiation between CDR. Because one problem that I have with CDR at present is we have price as, as a differentiator. But other than that, from a public perspective, it's all the same. All the tons look the same. And that's a huge issue because they're really, really not when it comes to the impact on the climate. Um, and so I'm very glad to see uh, an attempt at differentiation in terms of quality uh, when it comes to CDR. Thank you, Sebastian. I don't know if Johan or Enric want to comment on this, either on the positive or the still to be improved aspects of the proposal. Maybe Enric, to you and then. Uh, 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 I think also think that this is a great initiative uh, and in overall, we think it's uh, really positive uh, and uh, the approach is good uh, to build it in this way and to build to actually go in for the quality because what we have seen when we have uh, developed New World is that this is a jungle uh, and when we have tried to understand the willingness from the market to pay for uh, our situation where we have both the ability to provide MBS to uh, provide long lived products and provide technical solutions. Uh, we understand that, that this is so different. And, and uh, the approach to have all of them this uh, in the same scheme uh, and to actually have them different uh, is, a, is a really good approach. So I think the best uh, the, with this is actually the approach they have taken. Thank you, Henrik. Uh, Jan, maybe I see there is also a question in the in the box. Uh, the audience is getting a bit quieter, but I'm sure more questions will come up later during the, the rest of the webinar. The question is about the maturity somehow of the market. So if you think that there are technologies that are missing that could stimulate the development of carbon removal market, or if there are technologies that, they need, that still need to mature to reach higher TRLs. TRLs. Jan, maybe you want to reply this one or someone else? I don't know. Yes, I'd like to come have an opportunity to come back to, to reacting to the proposal, of course, on the commission. Um, sh should I wait with that? Uh, yes, please go with that and then we can look more okay, at I the can question go with because that now. now I see some more are coming up, so we'll have yeah, a lot yeah. to okay. deal with. <laughs> no, because I, I think Sebastian and Henrik uh, brought the, the very important and good points and, and I, I really support them from the same perspective and this differentiation is critical and key. I think we should just note that without the methodology, you don't have a product and without you know, a product, you don't have a market. And, and we have a credibility issue on the voluntary market today. And, and this is actually a chance for us to address that because the voluntary initiatives when it comes to removals are essential for fighting uh, climate change. And I think the whole European uh, Commission approach acknowledges that as we are actually now brought into achieving the targets of the European Union. So I think that is fantastic. And, and Hendrik talked about uh, the, the confusion. I mean, there is a divergence and fragmentation going on, many multiple initiatives. I hope this is the initiative that can bring that back because without the convergence, we will not reach the scale and the reason is you need to standardize these instruments. So you need to divide them in categories, like the three categories. But within those categories, you need to standardize such that the market can feel confidence in what they are acquiring and that those instruments can be traded in high volume and with open and simple information. Otherwise, we will not get the demand to drive the supply. And that brings me actually to the weak point of this proposal. I think it's a fallacy by the commission to say, oh, we're just looking on the supply side and not the use side. I think there is no supply without use and demand. It's a fallacy to divide this. So I accept the fact that they are not constructing the market, but I think the proposal should be much clearer in acknowledging that we do this in order to drive demand on the voluntary market, because without that demand, all the beautiful targets will not be achieved. And we will just be sitting there with a piece of paper. There needs to be demand. So I think this regulation before it is adopted should be amended to acknowledge that. And it should also think carefully about how we do combine uh, the uh, voluntary aspect and the fact that we want to bring in this to a compliance market. 
And this is super important for us because the same plant must be able to deliver in both to compliance and voluntary. And there must be no conflict and we cannot be under two different regimes and going through two different certifications. So I think we need to put that uh, in the framework. I have additional comments that I can bring up later, but I'll stop there for now. Thank you, Johan. I don't know if Enrique or Sebastian want to reply to this on the downsides of the proposal and a little bit the weak points indeed uh, as the one that's presented by Sebastian. Yeah, happy to. I think uh, you made some really good points, Johan, um, at kind of a level higher about what this is actually about. I'm I guess my comments are a bit more nitty gritty on the nuts and bolts of this proposal. Um, if you remember, there's these three categories, right? And I think with two of the categories, there's something that should really be added. Um, so the first one is when you think about permanent removals right now, it's very much only focused on geological storage, you know, which works for DAX and BEX, but it precludes a lot of other permanent uh, carbon dioxide removal technologies. And so my point here is really, we should focus on duration and not location. Uh, I mean, permanence is about timescales, right? It's not about place. So it's a bit odd that we connect it not with, with given certain, you know, durability of storage, but we connect it with a place. I think this is just, that was kind of a shortcut because they could lean on the CCS directive and get something out the door quickly in November. But I think that has to be amended now that we have time. The second thing is on the products. Um, on carbon products, it's currently written in a way that the assumption is that we have products, and there's a lot of products where that is the case, where we put CO2 in, and within a couple of years, a couple of decades, it's back in the air. True, there are products like that, but there's also products where we have almost permanence guaranteed if we put it in there. If I put biochar into concrete, even if the concrete gets recycled, like it will always be in that concrete. It's permanent removal. And so I think we need to adapt the product category in a way that is op more open-ended when it comes to the how long something can stay in a product. This is super complicated because the spectrum of carbon products is huge, but we need to recognize something that can be gone in a year again or even a month and something that can last basically forever. And my third point is... Um, I'll run a specific technology. I mean, carbon future is technology agnostic. You know, we anything that is high durability, we support. So we're big fans of BEX, of DAX, of EAV, every all of that. But the one technology that is really falling short right now, at least in the actual proposal, not in the impact assessment, is uh, biochar. It was mentioned by Fabian Ramos and very positively, but I, I maybe just quickly want to touch on that. For those who are less familiar, maybe on this webinar, biochar is, you know, you take any waste biomass, uh, you put it through a process called pyrolysis, which is more than 500 degrees, no oxygen. And what comes out is something that looks like coal, but is actually highly concentrated uh, CO2. And it has an inorganic fraction, 75, 80%, which are basically permanent. It's an amazing product, amazing process. And uh, it's currently constituting, if you look at today, it's a vast share of the high quality CDR market. So, you know, you've got 40% of all purchases, 87% of all deliveries are currently biochar. Um, and so it's, it's a bit underrepresented in my view uh, in the proposal, and it can fall into all the categories, but especially permanent removal and carbon products. And so my hope is that uh, it will get much more recognition as the proposal develops. Uh, and be recognized for the permanent solution that is already ready to scale today. Um, so yeah, those are my key three points. Yeah. Thank you, Sebastian. Eric? Yeah, I also see some uh, possibilities to improve this. Uh, and there is uh, one, one example is, uh, we're, we're most negative to the carbon farming part uh, and uh, they don't make difference between carbon removal and carbon avoid avoidance. For example, if you, not harvesting uh, at trees, it's not carbon removal, it's carbon avoidance. Uh, so you have to be strict to, to the, what's at the, the climate effect and what you're doing. Uh, and we also see that uh, if we're carbon farming, they're missing the carbon leakage. Uh, EU is really loving these types of eye look effects when you look on, on biofuels. Uh, and see what's the indirect effects if we do something. And here, if, if we stop uh, harvesting forest, uh, that, that will be carbon leakage. Uh, either you have to import from uh, outside EU uh, or you have to uh, substitute a fossil. So this has to be taken into consideration as well. The, the risk of carbon leakage, if you actually lower the 
use of, of uh, carbon, biogenic carbon, by store it uh, in, in the forest uh, instead. And we also um, have see, see some problem uh, with the lack of understanding of challenge of uh, uh, actually store uh, carbon in the forest. We have seen in Europe tremendous problem with the, the bark beetle. Uh, we have seen problem with uh, fires, with uh, storms, uh, etc. And this is to, to store carbon in uh, geological or in uh, bi biochar or in products is completely different from storing it in, in a forest because there are so much risk to, to store it in a forest that this carbon will be released and not substitute any fossil at all. So this is something they have to take into consideration uh, as well. Thank you, Enric. I see we have a few specific questions, and one in particular is looking at the, the technology which is applied uh, for the BEX plan in Stockholm. So, Jan, maybe you can explain a bit more about that. I don't know how long it will take, though, so I will <laughs> ask you to be short if you manage. <laughs> so it, it's uh, um, well, it depends really what angle of the technology uh, the person is interested in. Uh, we have uh, the bio CHP, so, so the biomass flow. Uh, is already in place. Uh, and of course, uh, that is incinerated in, in a traditional CHP uh, uh, manner. And, and there are fume gases uh, generated. Those fume gases are captured in a, a hot liquid solvent that consists of, of hot potassium carbonate. And, and, and under high pressure, uh, that then uh, combines with the CO2 in the fume gases whereas the other parts of the uh, fume gases uh, are emitted. Uh, if you look into those fume gases, roughly 19% of them are pure CO2. Uh, and, and out of those 19%, we are able to capture uh, roughly 95%. So it's a very high concentration. And of course, uh, that is a much higher efficiency than for instance, direct air capture. Uh, and and uh, th that's a great advantage with, with such a point source. And, and then in a second step, the pressure is, is released uh, and, and we can then capture and, and have the CO2 uh, redirected uh, to an intermediate storage uh, where we liquefy the CO2 awaiting uh, transportation to final uh, storage. So, so that is uh, roughly the process. And of course, for every plant, it's important to optimize the capture process. And, and we have chosen this uh, chemical uh, called hot potassium carbonate. And potassium carbonate is actually super friendly. It's a chemical that goes in even to food production. Uh, in, and in the second um, uh, step of this process, the hot potassium carbonate becomes uh, the uh, uh, hot potassium carbonate or, or baking powder, actually. So it's it, it's a circle where, where we switch between uh, potassium carbonate and baking powder back and forth, regenerating that chemical in, in that loop. Uh, we choose that chemical uh, because we have experience, uh, 40 years of experience from that, and it suits the composition of our flue gases and the temperature uh, that we have in the flue gases. Other plants would most likely choose something else, but for us that has been uh, optimized, and that is also what we are, are uh, proving, I would say, in the pilot plant that we have. Thank you, Jan. Uh, thank you also for trying to explain such a complex <laughs> thing in a, a few words. I really appreciate that. I see we have several questions on the carbon cre the credits. So one question is about uh, whether the market should allow to sell future carbon credits, so which are not yet removed yet, I think. That's my understanding. So if we should allow companies to sell CO2 credits and get money for investment, while well, this credit will be available only at a later stage. So this address to you, Sebastian, but if anyone else wants to also answer this or give their opinion on this, happy to hear that. Yeah, I mean, happy to win first. Um, my background actually also as an entrepreneur was in global health. And I think that's relevant here because the mechanism used uh, in this case, we did lend it, we did, tried first in the production of vaccines and HIV treatment. And uh, it worked very, very well. I'm not saying it's going to be the same here, but this, we're trying to tackle some of the same issues when it comes to the market. 
Um, and as such advanced market commitments, as they're called, are one of the most powerful tools we have available to channel funding into the industry. And if I can say one of the biggest things we're missing is yet more funding in the industry. Um, so we do need to find different ways, right? Credits are one, advanced market commitments are another. Now, I do hear the concerns, right, that carries a level of, of risk um, that these buyers are facing. Um, but frankly, as long as this is on a voluntary market, uh, these buyers are taking the risk. Um, yeah. They are very well informed, especially they're getting better and better informed. If you think about Stripe Climate, they're developing really robust methodologies to inform these AMCs. Uh, so I'm personally a big, big, big fan of them because they can channel desperately needed money into the sector. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, I see there is also a question about the voluntary based yeah, certification. Ah, sorry, Jan, please. Yeah, I, I have a strong opinion on this, of course, because we, we need to raise a lot of money uh, to build this plant. And um, I, I think one should be a little bit careful with words here because uh, we need to enter off-take contracts before we proceed to our final uh, decision. Or you could possibly find that money uh, with a, a VC company who, who is prepared to speculate. Uh, but a certain level of, of offtake contracts will be necessary in order to validate the market and figure out the price such that you can actually construct your business case. Now, that is not strictly speaking yet a future. A future is a financial instrument that would be regulated under financial law. Maybe it would be a very good idea to actually couple the offtake agreements with uh, proper financial future instruments such they, they could be properly traded and uh, those who trade in those would actually know what they are trading. But this would still be before then the delivery of the first uh, carbon removal unit. At the time when these futures or offtake agreements are turned into actual deliveries, that would be the time when we get paid. We wouldn't, we wouldn't look to get paid upfront uh, in connection with, with the CapEx investment. At CapEx investment, we would go and fund uh, a more from a traditional financial perspective with, with uh, bonds or loans or what have you as a means of funding that, or again, in the VC community. Thank you, Jan. Eric? Uh, it's also important to state here that, that uh, if you buy a future uh, for someone that will uh, capture this in the future, uh, I guess the, the buyer wants to have it uh, calculated right now. And if we start to, to buy futures, uh, sell, sell, uh, removing carbon right now, but it will be actually removed in a couple of years, then we are in trouble because the, this needs to be done on, uh, it would, uh, it, uh, the, it, the transfer needs to be done at the same time as it's stored uh, and it's removed. Uh, otherwise, uh, we will have some creative, uh, calculation here and uh, it will probably seem much better than there are and that it will be not gain the climate. And, and I support that and, and uh, I said nothing different in that no. respect. I mean, no. we, we, we do, we, we conclude the agreements now, but both the, the claims and the exchange of money happens in the future. Yeah, so offtake, I think it's uh, something that's important to work with. But you have to be aware that it's difference between offtake and future. Mm. For sure. And what do you think about the fact that having a voluntary based certification system could become a necessary in a way once we have a EU removal certification system in place? Is anybody worried about this or how do you see this uh, potential conflict between voluntary and European certification uh, system? Anyone that wants to take this one? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's interesting that Fabian is, is not around because this is actually one of the unclarities of, of the proposal. Uh, it, it clearly states in, in the third paragraph of the preamble that, that it is voluntary in itself. So ultimately, uh, the way I read it currently is that you, you don't have to join this scheme. You could do something completely different, but my uh, uh, will and ambition is, of course, that everything should converge on this in Europe, but it remains voluntary. 
but we also heard Fabian said that the idea is not to kill any of the uh, certification programs or whatever we should call them. What I think will die is all the methodologies of different actors that have developed alternative methodologies, at least in Europe they are not likely to survive this wave, but they will survive as certification schemes, govern, governance bodies, uh, registers, and, and all the other aspects, but not the methodology as such. That would be my prediction. Thanks for sharing your view, Jan. One other concern that I see coming from the question in the chat box is that uh, the, is a question actually on how we can generate demand for these certificates, so carbon removal certificates, without turning the CDR into an offsetting market and then diluting emissions reduction efforts. So how these two are two things are compatible and how we can reach to the point where we increase demand while not like let's say losing our emission reduction efforts. Sebastian, I see you're muted. <laughs> yeah, I can no I, I can take this. Um I mean this is a very very common um worry when it comes to the CDR space in general, right? Um, I think that the way that to approach it first, I mean, from my perspective, we just we need to think about them differently. Decarbonization and carbon removal, they are two separate streams. We need both. Um, and obviously they're interdependent. You know, the quicker we decarbonize, the less CDR will have to do. So actually they are, they are synergetic in that in that way. But also when it comes to regulation, they will be dealt with by different regulation, right? So for me, that's the first thing that I find combining them too much is actually not helpful and is not how it's going to be happening in practice. The second point I want to make is um, I see also, I'm not saying that the person who asked the question is saying this, but I, I see a lot of concerns around why do companies buy, for example, CDR? What is the motivation behind it and so on? I'm pretty pragmatic. For me, it's just about what is being purchased. Um, as I, I don't really care who's purchasing it and for what reasons, especially in the voluntary carbon market, as long as they buy the right stuff. What I have a problem with is if the wrong stuff is being bought um, and then claim to be the good stuff because that, that, that's plain wrong and that erodes trust. But if CDR, high quality CDR is bought by a company to offset, not to offset, to say whatever, that is secondary because we just want to make sure that we channel as much capital as we can into high quality CDR. But yeah, those are that's how I think about this question. Thank you, Sebastian. And this maybe leads me to another point, which is indeed public acceptance of carbon removals, of which we touch a bit upon, uh, not directly, but indirectly through the different uh, uh, topics we touched so far. So do you think this could be somehow a bottleneck, like a uh, lack of public acceptance of removal options as it was a bit for fossil-based CCS. Is anyone willing to take this one? <laughs> Eric? Uh, yeah, I can take it. Uh, I think it uh, will definitely be a be, uh, risk of a bottleneck. There will be def definitely be criticism. Uh, it, it will be just as uh, fossil CCS was criticized, uh, biogenic CCS will be criticized. Uh, we know that uh, there are a lot of opinions that is no uh, difference between biogenic and uh, fossil carbon. Uh, and the, the emission of uh, CO2 is the same, which on the molecule base is correct, uh, but on the uh, uh, carbon cycle is definitely wrong. But uh, there will be uh, uh, criticism. Uh, and I think this uh, approach here is so important to actually not making uh, this to a bottleneck because you, you the, the politicians has to stay strong uh, and has to create a really high quality framework so uh, we we can address that all the criticism is handled uh, and that there are no types of greenwash there are not carbon leakage there are not no uh, uh, lack of additionality uh, and things like that so we will get, uh, get criticized, uh, but we have to actually face it and have a good uh, methodology to meet it. Absolutely. And I think that's where maybe the European uh, framework would be helpful also to have a common methodology in this sense. Um, uh, Jan, I see there is a question specifically addressed to you. It's about uh, your plan to export removals. Are you addressing or are concerned about corresponding adjustment requirement? 
I'm not exactly sure how to interpret this question, yes. but see you, Johan. <laughs> yes, I, I guess we would need a separate conference. And, and whoever asked the question, feel free to contact me. We spend a lot of time on this question. Uh, and it's 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 part of actually my initial comment where I said that the European Union needs to speak up of the intention of the whole exercise. Uh, if you think about what they are doing with this proposal, they are encouraging trade uh, uh, in relation to carbon farming, I would say, because uh, carbon farming uh, instruments are uh, then becoming part of the Lulu CF targets uh, to achieve the minus 310 million tons. So the European Commission is uh, indirectly, but not explicitly, and I would like this to be explicit, that feel free to trade these instruments on the voluntary market and thus that would imply that corporations buy them to uh, achieve their climate targets at the same time we will be counting them in lulu cf and thus we will be counting them in our ndc and and this uh, is not considered double uh, claiming because it's happening in two separate regimes the regime of the nations on the one hand and the regime of the corporations on the other hand. Now, all of this is happening within one single NDC. Uh, so I think uh, as long as it happens within a single NDC, uh, I don't think uh, we have a problem. Uh, and I think most uh, actors would agree to that. Now, if we start to cross uh, the NDC line, a lot of different aspects opens up. But as long as the trade happens between corporations and the climate benefit with regard to the nation level stays with the host country or the country where, where the negative emission is actually happening, I believe that is still compatible uh, with the, the Paris Agreement. Uh, it only becomes a complication uh, if it is uh, also claimed by the nation of the country purchasing it. And uh, it enters several layers of complexity, trying to figure out all the modalities, how you could relate to the Paris Agreement. But yes, this is an unresolved question. Governments need to speak up quite urgently because this holds back the market. And I think millions of euros are waiting to be inv invested, just trying to understand this question. So it's super important. And I don't think Europe can be quiet any longer. Uh, and of course, my opinion is that we should encourage the joint funding by governments and corporations because we need to drive tremendous volumes of removals. And without the funding of the private sector, I don't think we will get there. We will not get to the necessary volumes when it comes to uh, geologically stored removals. Thank you, Jan. I see funding is coming back again and again, of course, when talking about carbon removal. So this will be for sure one of the highlights as well of today's discussion. But I see there is a question for uh, Sebastian, uh, because indeed we're talking about uh, well the carbonization of industry and in this case, specifically about the lime industry and how do you feel about carbonation of CO2 in lime-based products? So should this be certified under the CRCF proposal? Your view, Sebastian? So my, my short view is um, yes, and I think that that was also um, what I alluded to kind of earlier in my comments about what could be improved. Um, I think the carbon product category uh, should be expanded and should include also and recognize products that have a very high durability. And I think where this could be well placed. Um, so yes. Thank you, Sebastian. Straight to the point. <laughs> um, I see also we have some question about the, um, let's say, the difference or which are the panelists' views on the offset versus permanent removals. Because one is high in volume, low value, while the other one is very low volume, but very high value. So which ones to pick or which are your views on this? Can I can I take that one? Maybe as the first one. Go with that. So first, <laughs> um, I, I just want to clarify because people seem to really confuse these. Uh, CDR still offsets, right? Like, uh, I think we need to, you know, there's emission reduction, there's emission avoidance, and there's emission removal. Those are like, you know, mutually exclusive, collectively exhausting categories. Uh, but all of this can, in some shape or form, be counted as an offset, which is kind of the confusion that we're in, right? But um, so if I may rephrase the question, 
uh, is almost you know high permanence CDR versus potentially low permanence CDR. I think that's that, or I've seen also, uh, for example, novel CDR, but it's basically always about permanence. Um, in that case, they have, it's true, right now, high quality CDR, as I call it, is 0.1% of the CDR sector as a whole. That's, that's very, 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 very tiny, minuscule. Um, what I like to, to say is we need a portfolio approach, right? We need all of it. Uh, the 99.9% .9 can play a really crucial role. I'm talking about afforestation, reforestation. I'm talking about uh, car carbon farming, soil carbon. That is super important because we have we can scale that today. Yes, it's not particularly durable, but it will have to play a key role because it's huge and cheap and we already know what it does. And it has a lot of co-benefits to biodiversity, to agriculture and so on. What we need to focus on is not reduce that or criticize that. Let's keep pushing that. That's great. But we need to increase the overall pie and I think also increasingly the share of the high quality stuff, because that, that is best mm -hmm. for the climate and for humanity as a whole. So let's do both, but let's keep pushing also the high quality stuff in particular. Absolutely. Thank you, Sebastian, for your views. Yeah? Yes, I, I think actually we have climate confusion in three dimensions uh, right now in Europe and around the world. We, we have this reduction versus removals. Uh, we have the temporary versus the permanent, and we have the uh, national accounting system versus the corporate accounting system. And all those three questions makes the debate very often confused. Uh, when it comes to offset, I would encourage everybody not to think about the permanent removals as offsets. Offsets are really the concept used uh, traditionally to compensate unabated emissions. We are talking about a physical neutralization in order to handle your uh, residual emission that remain after your uh, best efforts to abate what is possible to abate. So I, I actually um, think that the, the concept of offset should stay with the old type of instruments that has been used for compensating unabated the geological removals try to address something else. And if you want to get some guidance, I think there are guidance. And there is an excellent document by uh, uh, Oxford, uh, the Oxford Principles, how to gradually phase in higher quality instruments on the way towards net zero. Thank you, Jan. Thanks for sharing your views. I actually see there is just one question that popped in in the chat, and I was just about to ask the very same question to Enric, because we spoke a lot about uh, well, funding, public acceptance, the Commission proposal, but we haven't spoke in a broader sense about uh, the impact of the policy framework on carbon removals, and in particular on BECs, for example. So the question, and I'm reading it, is what is what are your views, Enric, on red free proposal, and in particular on the suggestion from the Parliament to ban forest biomass uh, support for producing bioenergy. How will this affect carbon removal development in your views? Uh, it's a very important question. Uh, and uh, this is a problem with a lot of uh, what's going on in EU. Uh, there are so many uh, different, uh, well, let's say regulations uh, and different uh, views and there are strategies and uh, th there are like, quite clear journey where we want to go but then we have all these directives where there are small uh, wordings within the directives that might uh, ruin everything uh, and the, the red free is a, a typical example of where we actually can ruin quite this big uh, share of the potential uh, bex uh, investments and when we talk about these uh, uh, investments, which are in a couple of hundred million euros uh, capex for, for an, an abex plant, then all these risks that uh, it's a cure all the time is really, really not good for the investment climate. It's uh, because uh, we see now we, we have the red two, uh, which are it's quite good. Uh, it's something you can live with at least uh, and develop. Uh, then we have this revision ongoing where we have uh, the primary uh, with the biomass. That might be a, a really huge challenge because 
uh, if this will went went as uh, the parliament want uh, the proposal by the parliament then uh, we are not uh, able to use like four percentage of the the european energy uh, and i think we all know that we have quite a challenge with the european energy system at the moment and we will probably have for the coming decade and this will lower the the possibilities to invest in uh, energy consuming technologies uh, so here we have a problem that all these uh, regulations need to go in the same direction uh, and we also have the problem with in, in red free where they look on uh, to have some regulation on cascading which also can ruin this because uh, we, i think it's of course uh, we shall have high products first uh, we should work towards products but when we have these investments where actually some uh, feedstock for using for either for a CHP plant or for a pulp mill or for uh, some other uh, facilities where you can have backs all of a sudden the feedstock you're using for running this facility can be disallowed because someone else needs it and it's a higher value just not by they are they actually able to pay more but they have, have a higher value because the the eu says it's a, it's a high value and this also make it hard for companies to plan the sourcing plan their uh, possibilities to actually do these types of investment where, where you need uh, additional feedstocks so this is a, a really tough challenge uh, for investment or that they all the time uh, doing all these small changes in all directives that uh, can ruin a, a complete investment. Thank uh, you, Harry. That, as such, is something that they really, really want. For example, for BEX, the things they have given, given a lot of money to Stockholm Exergy in the Innovation Fund, which is great. Uh, and then they may, might ruin their investment with another directive. So. Uh, they have to take this into consideration. And do you think we should include carbon removal in the cascading uh, idea, or should this be something separate in your views, Enric? Uh, it's a way of <laughs> complicate uh, everything even more. Uh, and uh, so, but uh, of course, um, I think it shall not be. Uh, in the cascading because uh, it's it's not uh, in the same like say ballpark uh, in that view. So so I think it should not be uh, included in the cascading. Of course, if we need to uh, go around this problem, yes, uh, it might be something to look into. But uh, my general view is that we shall have the cascading in a more logical way and not by this uh, strict uh, guidelines and then uh, I think it's better to try to solve the problem rather than to fix it. Absolutely, well, we cannot agree more with you Enric on this last point. I don't know if Jan wants to comment on this, I saw you were nodding while Enric was speaking, so. <laughs> no, I think Hendrik is much more competent than I uh, on these matters. I, I agree 100% with him. I find it sad that we can't uh, rely uh, on the scientific approach that the JRC was proposing a year ago, uh, making a, a comprehensive study on, on you know, uh, how we should think about the biomass. And now adding this definition, which I, I think is not respecting that scientific uh, conclusion and also undermines our ambitions to, to, to have energy security in Europe. So, I think this has to be clearly uh, thought through, and I have confidence in the trilogue that they will arrive at a sensible conclusion. We also hope that indeed they will find uh, a good agreement between ambition, but also feasibility and implementation in the market. But at the same time, on top of the policy discussion, we also have some media ongoing discussion. And maybe, Sebastian, I would like to turn back to you, because recently there was a story published by The Guardian and The Zeit, so two well-known newspapers, addressing indeed the voluntary carbon market. What is your view on this story and how do you think this can impact uh, or which impact it can have on the market and its development? 
Yeah, very timely, and I think uh, still re reverberating in the sector, right? Um, so first, I think let's recognize that CDI exists within the broader uh, voluntary carbon market. I think that's very important to note. So we're all uh, affected by whatever happens to the voluntary carbon market. Um, also, I think it's important to note that it's a largely, the VCM is a largely unregulated market with significant money flowing into it. We've seen this happen in other industries and we know what happens usually when a lot of money goes into an unregulated market, something bad will happen at some point. Um, and so that's just the backdrop. I've been a bit surprised, honestly, by some of the reactions. Uh, I found many reactions very defensive. Um, I found very a lot of angry reactions um, and I don't think that's the right way to deal with the situation. Uh, personally, I think that we need to do a bunch of things. The first one is we need to uh, welcome investigative journalism. It's incredibly important. It plays a key role. Sometimes you might be on the receiving end. Other times you won't. And overall, the sector will be much better off if we have investigative journalism in it. Um, so that's the first thing that I would, that I would acknowledge. The second one is we need to take responsibility. Um, I mean, nobody I know who's an expert in the sector saw this as a surprise. Right, like I, we can debate the numbers, the methodologies, all of that, but I think we can all agree that there are some credits that are questionable at best, right? And um, and so we should take responsibility for that. We shouldn't own up to that. We should recognize that, and um, and we should think about what we can do to build more trust again with the public, because we're often trapped in our echo chamber, and whatever we say gets not nods from everyone. But that we're talking about the broader public in this case, because that's who the story was addressed to. And um, my third point, I already kind of mentioned that earlier, but I think it's a good opportunity. We're still in the infancy of this sector, right? We're so early stage. So now's the time to make changes and to get to make the necessary changes so that we don't carry something with us for decades. So let's try to get rid of the stuff that doesn't work and be open about that and double down on the stuff that do does work. And for me, CDR with high quality monitoring, reporting and verification is the answer in many ways, right? Um, and so actually, I think our sector is going to come out of it stronger as long as we we listen, we engage, we learn, we take responsibility instead of attacking. Uh, but yeah, I hope that uh, others will agree with this because uh, on social media, I've seen all sorts of reactions. Indeed. Uh, and I see some people are asking for a, a reference to the story of the Guardian. So I think we can also share maybe this later after the webinar. So we're getting towards the end of this very interesting session. I still see there are a few questions that we didn't manage to address at this stage. I would maybe like to pick a couple of last one or two. Uh, one is about the life cycle approach. So if you think that the application of life cycle approach to carbon removals would risk create a double counting of CO2, and this particularly when calculating electricity consumed in a bioenergy-based plant to capture CO2, and then deduct to the association CO2 emission. It's a bit of a complicated question. I don't know if you have any thoughts a bit more in general on this subject, any of you? <laughs> I think this is one of the very important subjects uh, and a little bit confused subject, actually. Uh, I think if you read a proposal, they point to the experience we have from the European Innovation Fund. Uh, and we have gone through that, uh, obviously, successfully. Uh, so we will see what comes out. But, but, but I think all these counterfactual kind of ideas uh, are extremely difficult uh, to uh, actually uh, work with. Uh, it's very important to take count, uh, into account the direct impacts of uh, your operation, obviously. But the indirect impacts outside your, your, your immediate uh, boundary. I don't know uh, if uh, that is ever going to work out in, in a good way. There is a way to do it within in, in the Innovation Fund, and, and that approach um, uh, could work. Um, I think when we have this debate, we should note uh, and we should discuss what is actually the role of the ETS system. The ETS system has a cap. That cap is now being strengthened by the uh, fit for 55. That cap is going down every year. So is there even a um, indirect leakage effect? I think is a question that you should think about. And, and uh, if there is, maybe there is something wrong with the ETS because the ETS should actually set the total emissions of our system. So, so this, I, I'm sure this will be an, a very heated debate uh, in the work of the commission. 
for sure. And do you think the fact that indeed CDR for now is not included in the UETS will be a major impediment to like uh, financial investment decisions or would this not really be uh, like have an impact on, on this? Or if Sebastian or Enrique also want to step in. Open floor. Or Johan? <laughs> I didn't get the question. What is not included? Uh, the CDR inclusion, the CDR. So carbon removal and ETS because ah, okay. Even... No, no I, I think uh, uh, Sebastian already talked about that uh, directly or indirectly. I, I obviously it cannot be part of of the ETS. Uh, the the ETS represents our, our uh, reduction path, and and talking about you know confusing uh, uh, removals with reductions and and impeding reductions. There is a point that it should not be included at this point because we should pursue the reduction path of the ETS, of course, at this point. So I, I fully share the Commission view that before 2030, uh, it would endanger the reduction path and for that reason should be left outside the ETS. Then we need to find a clever mechanism to incentivize it in other ways. And we are working with a lot of instruments. Uh, what I think is missing, uh, and I'd like the uh, Commission and the Council and the Member States to do is to set up national targets for uh, removals outside the land sector. That is missing and that must be set up and that should then be driving all the incentive schemes so that we have a target. The 5 million by 2030 is too small and too generic. Thank you, Jan. I don't know if Sebastian wants to comment on this. Otherwise, we have one last question, which is actually coming up a couple of times, which is about SBTI. And uh, in particular, they're asking you your approach to science-based target initiatives for removal, uh, because this uh, like SBTI approach uh, uh, being permitted for only less 10% of net zero. So do you see this changing since there are several multinationals that have signed up to this commitment framework? So does any of you have a view on SBTIs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel I talk too much, maybe, but, but this is an extremely important, we talk about demand signals, and, and we have really two instruments, uh, either uh, the voluntary market or, or government aid, and obviously SPTI is extremely important on the voluntary carbon market. I don't think the 10% is a problem. I mean, uh, typically, uh, most sectors should be reducing themselves down to 10%. What may be a problem, uh, depending on how you read SPTI, is when you should start to invest in the negative emissions with permanent removals. And my opinion is that you should start today. So you should start investing at least your 10%, because those 10% that represent the residual, they're already present today, and they will not go away. And every company should be part of actually helping this industry to kick off and start preparing to take on their removals. And that's typically what we see actually the American companies do more by engaging in the Frontier Fund and in the first mover coalition uh, within the WEF. So, so I think 10% uh, is not the problem. The problem is that we should start uh, addressing the residual already now and not at the end only. Yeah. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Eric? Yeah, I agree that uh, ten percent. Uh, you can argue for exactly percentage, but uh, I think it's important to have this quite low limit because ten percent is tremendous volumes still. Uh, and if we increase and have uh, like you, uh, either free or much higher, then you will lower the uh, the investment in renewables. You will lower investment in in uh, the need of using for example bioenergy you, you uh, wind or some solar or something so uh, and the, the development of biofuels uh, of uh, e-fuels of everything so it's important to actually still have quite low uh, possibilities to use uh, the carbon removal but uh, uh, if it's 10 percent or if it should be a bit higher uh, but still remember 10 percent is tremendous volumes and it's more important to actually start working with this right now than rather waiting for until 2040 because we need the, the market to grow now thank you Enric, and thank you actually well to all the three of you uh, i think it was really a dense conversation a lot of things 
a lot of information as well, also because CDR is relatively a new market in a way, or at least still beginning and starting to grow even more. We, we've seen we have now the first of a kind uh, proposal from the European Commission to establish a common European uh, certification scheme, which is groundbreaking, even though it relies a lot and maybe somehow too much on existing schemes and uh, previous, um, let's say, uh, examples and legislation. And it doesn't really look at the demand part, which is somehow missing in the picture at this stage of the certification. We've talked about another very important point, which is financing and how to raise uh, not just public, but especially private funding and how the fact of selling uh, removals, which are not yet in the market, can also be part of the conversation. And last but definitely not least, we spoke, we spoke about public acceptance, both for the general public, but also for policymakers and media, which is one of the hot topics at the moment, including the legislation regarding bioenergy. So having said that, I think we will have a lot more to talk, but we reached the time of two hours, so I would say that's enough. But don't forget, we will have our next uh, working group on carbon removals coming up in April. So if you're really interested to follow up on this conversation, don't hesitate to reach out to my fellow panelists, to Bioenergy Europe, or to join us for the next event. Thank everybody for staying with us, and uh, well, hope to see you soon. Bye.